welcome everyone to our webinar today on using ABCD to build community in social housing. Um, we, uh, the purpose of today is to demonstrate the value of asset-based community development in advancing poverty-related issues. Uh, today we're going to focus on social housing um, in Durham region and we have Cheryl Bilal and Lisa Pitcher to join us today. Um, Cheryl has been working in Whitby, Ontario with social services for the past 25 years, nine of those with housing. Initially, Cheryl was responsible for conducting operational reviews, ensuring that housing providers are compliant with relevant legislation and program policies. In 2018, she transitioned into one of two new positions in housing services, which were created to provide tenant support and community development. Lisa has worked in social housing in various capacities since 2011, mainly in a supportive role assisting tenants with eviction prevention. She joined housing services in 2017 as one of the region's new housing coordinators and tenant support staff. Lisa spends much of her time working with our senior tenants, but works in partnership with Cheryl on special projects, including the local deepening initiative at Lakeview Harborside. While Lisa and Cheryl have experience working with tenants in a supportive capacity, they have sought out learning opportunities to advance their skills, including working with Tamarack. Today's webinar is being moderated by Heather Keem, one of our Tamarack's own managers of cities with vibrant communities. I'm going to hand it over to Heather to first do an, an introduction and overview of asset-based community development. Thank you, Al, and welcome everybody. I am really excited to be on the call here with Lisa and Cheryl. Uh, I've been working, I've actually been working, but more learning with and from them <laughs> the past year um, in this project um, and using ABCD principles um, to help build community. <clears throat> And so we get, before we get started, I thought, you know what, let's just do a very quick um, primer on what is ABCD. And um, ABCD all started with two, two gentlemen, um, Jody Kretzman and John McKnight, and they did a four-year learning journey. They visited 20 cities and 2,000 neighborhood people. They asked a question, can you tell us what people who live on this block or neighborhood have done together to make things better. And they collected hundreds of stories and analyzed them in terms of what neighbors had used when they made things better. Their basic finding was that people drew from five neighborhood resources, also known as assets, no matter what the story was. These assets were the talents and capacity, capacities of local residents, the voluntary clubs, groups, and associations, their local institutions, for-profit, non-for-profit, and government, the land and other physical assets, and the process of exchanging, so sharing, bartering, telling stories, buying, selling. Uh, next. So when you're thinking about asset-based community development, think about a glass that is half full and half empty. It is clear that every individual and community has needs and deficits, but it's also clear that every individual and community has gifts and capacities. When we think of people with deficits and needs, we classify them as clients or priority populations. And when, we, and when people are identified with their gifts and their assets, they are people who become citizens and residents. So take the time to think about how you approach your community work. Is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? Next. If you look at a neighborhood in terms of the needs, this is how it looks. Unemployment, physically inactive, dropouts, gangs, lead poisoning. You know, we, tra we traditionally, when we're looking at um, our communities and programming, we traditionally look at the data. We look at what is missing and what is wrong with our community, and then we develop our programs to fill that gap or void or make it better. When you look at this map, is this a community you would want to live in? Where do you start? 
And then it also becomes very overwhelming. And, and are we going to make a difference when we look at this map? The consequences of a needs map is that a lot of the times the money comes into our community for programming and they're often often narrowly defined. Money can get misdirected towards professionals and not residents. We place focus on leaders who can magnify the deficiencies. We reward failures and foster dependency on systems. Our community has a poor self image and then we all of this put together, you get the sense of hopelessness. Next. This is the same map, but this is looking at it as a glass half full. We're looking at the assets in the community. We've got businesses, we've got individuals, artists, the youth, Older adults, parks, churches, associations, the crochet club, the, the gardening club, the, the men's garage club. Um, so when you're looking at, at, at this, you see that the deficit-based approach and identifying the needs makes us think that we need to help. We have the answers. But when you look at the asset an asset-based approach to the community, we're identifying and building what's already strong in our community. Uh, asset-based community, asset community development empowers individuals and associations and institutions to come together to, to support each other on the strengths that we all have in our community. Next, the principles of asset-based community development are pretty, are pretty simple. Everybody has a gift. Each person in the community has something to contribute. Relationships build community. People must be connected for sustainable development. Citizens at the center. Citizens must be viewed as actors, as participants in the community and not as passive recipients. Leaders involve others. Strengths come from a broad base of community action. People care. Listening to people's interests challenge the myths that there's a lack of interest or lack of involvement in our community. Listening. Decisions should come from conversations where people are truly heard. And ask. Generating ideas by asking questions is more sustainable than giving solutions. Next. This is what Lisa and Cheryl at Lakeview Harborside did. They asked questions. They looked at the community on what is strong and not what is wrong. They realized that, you know what, drawing a map of what's wrong in our community is not the way to go. And they're realizing this, and they're going to tell you this in their story, that drawing a map of the assets and the gifts and bringing people together have built a strong sense of community and has helped in moving from being a being a doer to being a supporter so i'm really excited that you're all on the call today to hear lisa and cheryl and their inspirational story about how they went from doing for the community to doing with the community so i'm going to pass it over to you lisa and cheryl thank you heather <laughs> um and uh thank you for that lovely introduction Elle. Um, as Elle mentioned, uh, my name is Cheryl Bill-El, and um, this is my co-worker, Lisa Pitcher. In 2017, Housing Services created two new Housing Coordinator Community Programs positions with a focus of supporting the region's social housing communities, developing innovative programs and services that enhance the comfort, safety, and security of residents while encouraging the sustainability of vibrant, inclusive neighborhoods through partnerships with other departments and service agencies. Lisa and I filled these two positions and today we will highlight our partnership with Tamarack and our journey to deepen community using the ABCD approach in our Lakeview Harborside community. Lakeview Harborside is our largest family site. There are 173 townhomes and a 12-unit apartment building. It is located in South Oshawa, 
situated right alongside picturesque Lake Ontario. There are many parks and sports fields nearby. In the beginning stages of our new roles, we were trying to bring programming into the community room at Lakeview Harborside. This is a picture of me trying to encourage people to attend a particular program. We soon realized that in a lot of cases, there seemed to be a lack of interest from the community to attend. We became discouraged until one day, a group of tenants came forward to say that they were not interested in the particular program that we were trying to promote, but they were interested in using the room to crochet together. This is a program that we would never have thought of starting, and the crochet group has become the most regularly attended program in the community room. It is entirely led and attended by residents. Housing's role is simply to attend, to arrange access to the room. This was the aha moment that led us to realize that we need to ask the community what they want, instead of assuming we know what they need. Coincidentally, we were scheduled to attend TAMRAC's ABCD Community Development Conference in Kitchener the very next month. There we learned quickly that others had experienced similar aha moments. We learned about the local deepening initiative, community initiative, and TAMRAC agreed to mentor us through a process to deepen community at Lake Harborside using the ABCD approach. Asset based community development makes us switch our approach from trying to meet the needs of our residents to enabling them to identify their own strengths and come up with their own solutions. This is an empowering process that, is, is, sorry, this is an empowering experience for the community. It increases creativity, self-esteem, and a sense of belonging. It builds social relationships. It reduces isolation and it improves mental health. The Local Deepening Community Initiative is a six stage process. We are currently in the fifth stage. Stage one involves the project launch, creating and training the local leadership team. In January of 19, 2019, in an effort to create our leadership team, we approached local agencies, organizations, and regional departments who were already working in the community and had developed relationships. We also advertised within the community for people who would be interested in participating. We built a leadership team consisting of 12 people, five of which are residents. An asset survey was developed in order to collect data about the strengths, interests, and hopes for the community. Training was conducted for the facilitation of community conversations at which these asset surveys would be completed by the residents. Stage two involves collecting community data. At this stage, residents hosted community conversations. They were promoted at two events. The community cleanup day, where members of the leadership team spread the word about upcoming conversations while working together with the residents to do some spring cleaning of the grounds. After cleaning, we enjoyed a barbecue and a movie night. The conversations were also promoted at our annual summer kickoff. Historically, this event is attended by agencies who promote the services and programming that they are able to provide to the community. This year, the residents set up a booth to promote the community conversations. They had sheets for people to sign up for particular dates that had been scheduled. One of the youth in the community ran a community art project where residents placed handprints on boards that were later assembled into the shape of a tree, our community tree. Over the summer, the resident members of the leadership team hosted eight conversations. The last conversation was advertised as a corn roast and 41 surveys were completed that day. Stage three involved community data synthesis, identifying themes. A total of 80 surveys were completed. A member of our leadership team who specializes in surveys and data collection advised the team that if 30% of households completed a survey, that would be a big success. In fact, 43% of households completed a survey. So we were thrilled with that result. We were also pleased that out of 80 surveys, 
74 people indicated that they wanted to work together to strengthen their community. A community report was drafted that profiled the demographics of the people who completed the survey, as well as their skills, assets, hopes, and potential priorities for shared action. The report contained two and a half pages of gifts and skills that people have. Skills that residents want to learn and skills that people want to teach others. Because the report displays both the skills that people want to learn and the skills that people are willing to teach, it is possible for people to help each other instead of having to ask outside agencies to do this, therefore creating healthier connections and networks. Stage four is the celebration. This is the stage where we celebrated. We invited the community to hear about the results of the surveys. We enjoyed soup made from locally reaped vegetables and residents volunteered to help cook the soup. We created open space with stations set up representing the most common themes identified from the survey. So the most common hopes or projects that residents want to see happen. The four main themes were beautification, safety, communication, and social activities. Each station had a volunteer, and as residents went from station to station, they could add their own ideas and indicate how involved they wanted to be in that particular theme. We also had an art display. Art that was created over the summer was displayed proudly. We debuted this community tree of handprints that was crafted at the summer kickoff. It was incredible to see the kids' faces light up when they saw their own art displayed in the community room. We capped off the evening with a talent show. The report listed so many talents within the community as well as an interest in a talent show. So we held our first Lakeview's Got Talent Show. It certainly blew us away to see everyone participating and cheering everyone on. It could have gone all night. Stage five involves the action planning and we are currently in the action planning stage. So many ideas came from the surveys and the celebrations. We met with the resident leadership team members and have come up with ideas that they would like to move forward first. So now we will meet with the larger leadership team on March 5th and see how these agencies can support those ideas. We are also expanding our resident leadership group and hoping to recruit more members at upcoming events. Stage six will involve working together to implement shared action. At this stage, we will be building and sustaining the action plan. The leadership team will meet to finalize the plan and monitor the actions and outcomes. At this point, I will turn the rest of the presentation over to my coworker, Richard. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so let's make the connection between poverty reduction and ABCD. So what we know is that there are several causes of poverty, including community conditions. We also know that health is one of the biggest determinants of poverty. Relationships are also important. Relationships build a community, and people must be connected in order for sustainable community development to take place. Through our work with the Local Deepening Community Initiative, we are trying to improve community at Lakeview Harborside. We've seen firsthand how building relationships and connections with one another can have a positive impact on the residents. Not only has the resident leadership team built lasting relationships with each other, but they've also reached others in the community. We've received feedback that being involved in this project has improved mental health and isolation. The participants are actively creating and nurturing relationships with one another. And by creating these connections as part of this project, we are seeing the positive impact on the broader social determinants of health, improving self-esteem, increasing creativity, providing a sense of belonging, as well as reducing isolation and improving mental health. So as we've worked through the various stages of this project, we've learned many lessons along the way. Um, so not only are we building relationships with the leadership team, but we are building relationships in the community. Community development work moves at the speed of trust, and to do this work well, trust is essential. However, we realize that we will never be able to develop the same type of relationships with residents as they will be able to develop with each other, and that's okay. 
The key for us is to be transparent in our role in the community and support the residents in creating relationships with one another and staying consistent in our approach. Um, it's very easy to come up with ideas for the community that we think are fantastic. Um, this often leads us to get us a little bit off track. Um, so the goal of, the, of ABCD is for the community to decide and lead the way. So while we may think we have great ideas, it's important to not get away from ABCD to ensure that we're focusing on, on what the community wants and what they're willing to lead themselves. Um, in order to do this work, it's necessary to shift your own attitudes as well as your colleagues, the residents, and the rest of the leadership team. We found for us that it was difficult to relinquish control. For the conversations for the project, they were entirely led by the residents. When Tamarack suggested this in the first place, we were taken aback because we thought we needed to be a part of those conversations. After speaking with Tamarack, they reiterated how important it was for this to be led by the residents, and in fact, we were not needed, we are not the experts, and we simply needed to support. It is difficult to switch from being the doer to the supporter when we're so used to being in that role. But we found that in order to enable the residents to lead, we needed to take a step back and allow them to grow into those roles. Last but not least, we learned to encourage everyone to have fun. We've really enjoyed working through this project with the residents and it has been incredible to watch them kind of come out of their shell, let their passions and creativity flow and connect with their community. So I wanted to touch on where you could start if you thought that ABCD could benefit your community. Um, I wanted to highlight the concept of to, for, with, and by. Um, this has really resonated with us throughout our journey, and it just keeps you accountable and aware of how you're really showing up in your community, the communities that you serve. So if you start operating in the with and by quadrants, um, it'll get you closer to reaching your ABCD goals. Learn to be aware of when you are doing two and for someone and try to do it differently. Um, shifting your attitudes from focusing what it, on what is wrong to what is strong. What assets do you have in your own communities? Think about people. Do you have gardeners, tinkerers, storytellers? What about geography? Are you close to a park, by the lake, close to community centers or doctor's offices? Those things are all strengths and it focuses on what you do have rather than what you don't. How can you leverage those strengths and use them to make the communities you serve better? Also, identify a red tape that can be changed to yellow or green. I'm sure everyone has been frustrated by the inevitable red tape we all face. Sometimes that red tape is non-negotiable, but sometimes if you can get creative, there are ways around it, or perhaps you come to the realization that it never should have been red tape in the first place. Our crochet group, for example, it was a little bit of a challenge to give the residents access to the room, but eventually we were able to make that happen, and now that group is run entirely by the residents. That is the goal for all of the programs and initiatives at Lakeview, that the residents are no longer clients in a service and become neighbors, neighbors and friends in their community, connected to one another and leading the way. There we go. Oh, I think you're still muted, Heather. Yes, I am. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl and Lisa. And um, I hope you are all inspired just as much as I have um, over this past year. And um, I actually pulled up the report and I just wanted to, there's, there's two final thoughts that residents wrote in their survey that I just wanted to wrap this up with. What it, one of them is, I've enjoyed taking part in and seeing everything that the community has done to grow and look forward to seeing it grow further. Another one is, I am hopeful for this community and the people within it. I'd like to find way, a way to help, but not sure how or if I can. And so through this process and gathering the gifts and the assets and just asking people, it has changed the, the perception. And in this survey, um, Lisa and Cheryl talked about that 74%, 74 of the individuals wanted to work together, but there was an, also another question that we asked, and it was, how connected do you feel to your community? 
uh, how connected do you feel to the people in this community? And 54 said very low. And so when you're looking at the, I, I, feel, I feel not connected to my community, but 74 is I really want to help and grow this community. That's, that's huge. And just by asking that question and being asked that question has, has inspired and, and given hope that, you know what, me as an individual in this community, I can make a difference. And I have support here to help me make a difference. Um, so um, now it's time for questions. Uh, you can either, un you can unmute yourself. Um, and if I see your microphone unmuted, I will call upon you. And, but I know that uh, there is usually this lull or pause. So I always have questions in my back pocket uh, to ask. And so um, I'm gonna ask some questions and please jump in when needed. Um, so I, I have a question about, um, if you could go back to three years ago or, or even longer, knowing now about the two, four, buy with and asset-based community development, what would you say to your new self getting into this field? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, that two, four, buy with idea was hugely, it hugely resonated with me. It was, it was an aha moment for me. So I definitely would, um, I would have done my work a lot differently. Um, I've always been, um, it's always been important for me to, to do my job well and be an expert in my field. So um, it, I definitely would have been doing my work a lot um, differently, um, you know, doing more listening about what mm -hmm. is important to, um, um, you know, what, what is important to other people in terms of determining how successful I am, my job, for sure. I agree with that. And just to being in sort of the helping professions, you always kind of come to work and, and want to do and fix and plan and all that stuff. So I think going through this experience, it was really um, powerful for us to kind of give that up. And again, we're not the experts and just to support the, the resident leadership team and then watch them come into their roles so well and, and grow. It was, it was, you know, an amazing experience for, for Cheryl and I to watch. Right. So, um, but yeah, definitely showing, showing up differently um, and not, you know, trying to fix and, you know, help all the time. I think that's important. So. That's great advice. <laughs> uh, so I do remember um, in the very beginning in, in stage one, um, we had a conversation about the leadership table. And I remember you saying, who should be at this table? How do we get them there? And so we have a question from um, Niagara um, to talk a little bit more about your leadership table your leadership team and who funds your work. But I'm also adding in there, can you just talk about that process and how you brought them together? So um, it did a little, we, we had to do a little bit of, um, um, you know, exploring in the community to find out, you know, which, um, which, who's already working in the community. So we were able to identify um, some some agencies that were doing some work already. Um, and uh, so we, we called them to the table. Um, and working for the region, we have a lot of departments that were interested in the work that we were doing, right? So inviting um, the health department in particular um, to the table as well. Um, and uh, some, some people that we thought would, would be um, very helpful were people who um, we're experts in things like surveys and data collection. So we invited um, uh, people with those skill sets as well. Um, um, what, was, what was the next question? Uh, the process? Uh, it, it, just a bit about the, like, the process. And then they're, they asked about who funds your work. So we are, um, you know, we, we work for the region of Durham. So we are government funded. Um, we um, access the, the support systems through the leadership team um, for uh, other assistance that we might need. Um, mm -hmm. And um, 
is part of the process and where we are now, we may be um, looking into applying for a grant to continue the work. Mm -hmm. And, and really in terms of like looking over the year um, and budget wise, it, it really hasn't cost a lot of money. No, it really hasn't. It really hasn't. We, we you know, um, we were very lucky to be able to access um, when we had a barbecue, you know, one of the agencies came and provided the food and the barbecue. They just yeah. showed up and fed everyone. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was fantastic. Um, another one of a member of our leadership team has actually funded um which was a fantastic thing actually, they, they were able to support one of the resident members of the leadership team to come to a TAMRAC conference. So in partnership with TAMRAC and the region and housing services, and it was Caria actually, who um, managed to pay for um, her accommodation costs um, so that she could come out and learn how to be a leader in her own community, which was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. Going back, sorry, Heather, going back to the beginning a little bit, um, because me and Cheryl had sort of been working in the community and doing events that um, weren't that successful because we didn't, you know, start with Tamarack right away, um, we kind of knew a little bit of an idea of what was important to, to the community. So um, we had like Feed the Need come in because food security was an issue. So we kind of wanted to mold the leadership team um, to once we went through the process, once we knew what the community wanted, we would have people around the table that could move those things forward, that could support those those initiatives. So um, that's kind of where we we went with it. I don't know if that doubles up on what Cheryl was saying, but and and um, having come to some of the meetings, on the very this is kind of one of my. Um, I guess impacts that has happened with the leadership team because in the very beginning when we started talking about this and started talking about okay you know how are we gonna you know support this community a lot of the agencies around the table is you know when we when we said you know how about um, um, food like security and then they were like yeah we've got this program and we could bring this in and we can do this in and 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 we kind of said whoa let's yeah. wait we don't want to do like we're not we're not asking in organizing programming now in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. We yeah. want to we want to work with the community to find out what what can we do as organizations and associations around the table support them to be able to do what they want to do. And I noticed the shift. So in the beginning it was a lot of oh I could do that. Oh we could bring this program. I've got this program. Mm -hmm. And it shifted to oh well, I've got a bit of, I've got resources I can support them in this. And so I, mm -hmm. I saw that shift, that mindset shift um, within the leadership team um, to do that. And we, so we have another question, question about have residents organized to fundraise for their projects and or are they consider funding their own uh, or finding their own funding source? Um, so far. Throughout the, the project, all of the funding has come either through um, uh, housing services, which has been very small uh, contribution, and the agencies involved in the leadership team. So at this point, when we are going to be meeting with the larger leadership team, which is going to be next week, we're going to be talking about things like how can we, how can we fund, these are the things that, that the community is interested in moving forward, how can we fund that? Um, and if people are unable to, to help with that, then we will have to look into other funding sources, which, um, um, which will most likely be a grant. Mm -hmm. And so this is, and this is the phase we're in right now, right? So we have, <laughs> we, we have our draft action plan. Um, and you know, how we want to, how the, the community wants to go forward. So then you have to look at, okay, what, what can, what can be done with no or low cost? And, you know, and these are the, going back to the beginning of those three questions. What can the residents do for themselves, mm -hmm. you know, that are no cost, they, they completely 100% done by them. What is it that they want to do that they can do some of it, but outside organizations can port, support some of it in some way, whether it's human resources or financial. And then the last question is, is what do the residents want to do that they, they, 
it's out of their hands and their capabilities to do that the outside organizations can step forward in and do. And so that's the phase that, that you guys are in right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so there's a question here um, about your positions. Mm-hmm. So you're they're just asking because they, they came on a little late. So just talk, can you just talk a little bit more about your positions? Where does it sit under? Um, yeah. And, you know, how many families do you support and how do you make linkages with community members? Okay, so um, in housing services, there's a subsidiary, um, Durham Regional Local Housing. So DRLHC owns X number of social housing buildings in the municipality. Um, So we have the property managers that manage those buildings. And then we have Cheryl and myself who work in tandem with the property managers um, doing the community development piece, but then also... um, any tenant support issues. So a lot of the times they call us in if there's conflict in in a building, we will come in and sort of assist with that or give referrals, that sort of thing. Um, so, so I again, I work mostly with seniors. So I have 13 and then one um, family site and then Cheryl works in most of the other family sites. So some seniors buildings, yeah, but you have what, 10 or 10 family sites or that yeah does that answer the question i think so yeah um and and so does anyone want to unmute themselves and ask a question is there a a brave person out there who wants to unmute i'm good reading them i I just i just want to make sure that i'm i'm capturing the questions right Uh, we have we have about 10 more minutes for questions um i'm just wondering if you could reflect on the past year um, and tell us what is the biggest change you've seen so far in the community? I think that people are excited. People are, are looking forward to um, what, what's going to come out of this, right? I mean, it's been a year and a bit of, of going through the stages and saying, wait, 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 we're going to, we'll get there with, with the program. So I think that now that we're in sort of the, the implementation stage, I guess, um, they're, they're excited and they're hopeful. And I think that um, there's been history of things that haven't worked out. And I'm, I'm thinking that that sort of negative attitude is leaving and, and, and they're excited and hopeful for, for the future. And, and, and just people becoming more connected. They're, mm-hmm. you know, they, the community room was not being used very much. And now there's things going on and people are coming out and, you know, people are actually approaching us and Mm -hmm. we we're not asking them. They're coming up to us and and saying um, that they really appreciate having these things in the room and that, you know, like a real sense of feeling like, um, you know, that we really care about um, their community and, and helping them to make change. All right, any more questions? We have one. All right. Hi there, it's Laura from Niagara. I'm just curious as to how you're able to continue the work while influencing partners and their way of business being, you know, to do for people or charity-minded service provision. Hmm. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that what's, what's really been great is having um, the agencies involved in this process all the way. So they are themselves are learning about ABCD community development. Um, so that's been really helpful. And then the agencies that we've had to reach out to just sort of, um, or that have been sort of reaching out to us and wanting to do things in the community, um, just sort of having that um, uh, conversation to, to let them know about the project and the, and what we're doing and um, that we would be able to, we would be happy to um, um, to let them know what the community has in mind and whether they can support them. Um, so, so that's what we have in, in mind moving forward is, um, is being able to explain how we are going to be moving forward with, with this, you know, um, community in terms of what the community is interested in doing, it's it's definitely a challenge, but it's and it's slow, um, and um, 
but I think that that people are starting to to really understand the importance of it. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I'm just curious about the timelines. So with the stages, and I think this question maybe I can pose to Heather <laughs> and um, Lisa uh, and Cheryl as well um, about the in terms of the process. I think you. You talked a little bit around that kind of when you started um, and how it unfolded, but um, really kind of how much time are there, is there a, like a guide, a guide to how much time you spend at each stage and and maybe how long it might take to get from stage one all the way through to stage six or to complete stage six. I, th I think I, I kept saying to Lisa and Cheryl, you know, I think we just took eight steps back. <laughs> sure we could do 10 steps forward from this. <laughs> that was going to be one of my other questions. It was like, do the, do the stages blur a little bit or do you like end up going, you know, is it, is it very, is it linear? Is it a linear process or is it kind of like you're going back and forth all over? kind of because of the nature of working with community community engagement and I, I felt I felt like we actually you know went to the end of, and completed each stage um, in the process mm -hmm. I think that the, the challenge was actually completing each stage in the process you know there you know we were kind of trying to to hurry up and finish the stage um, but it is um, it's interesting you know when you're working with people and you, you know you, you've got to um, you've got to be patient with with your, yourselves and you have to be patient with the whole process um, because you have to take the time for um, everyone in the it, it goes on community time it doesn't yeah. go on our time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. residents they have their own lives and things going on in the background right so we've had to kind of navigate that and sort of people have come in and, and came back and um, depending on what's going on in their life. Right. So it's, it's, it's slow. <laughs> it, and it, it is, it is really about being creative. Um, yeah. And so like I remember um, when we were doing the, it, we were in the data collection stage mm -hmm. and doing the surveys. And I, and I remember you coming saying, you know, we've only got this many surveys, you know, what do we do? Do we just stop here? And, you know, we talked about well, what's another creative way we can do it. And, and, you know, food brings everyone together and you're like, well, we could do a corn roast mm -hmm. and the corn roast is where you got, you know, a good chunk yeah. of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that right? Pretty, yeah. That was pretty incredible. Yeah. <laughs> And one of actually one of the resident leadership team members, her uncle, did her uncle as a farm yeah. oh, brother in law had a farm and actually supplied all the corn and we borrowed a barbecue from one of the local churches and I Googled how to grow corn and I learned in a day and we just did it and it was fantastic and that's where we got half of the surveys in, in one event, right? Mm -hmm. so you just Yeah, yeah. It was pretty incredible to see the turnout for that event because, mm -hmm. you know, initially, you know, we had had a barbecue, movie night, um, and we went from seeing, like, in some of the conversations, nobody turned up. And then the last conversation, over 100 people turned up for corn. So <laughs> it, was, it was just fantastic, um, really, to see um, how, how it moved. You know, I think that a lot of it had to do with the fact that, um, you know, you know, you're dealing with with people that might be a little bit they're not familiar with the process. They might be a little bit wary of the process. So you have to give it time for people to come and check it out. And then mm -hmm. and then the more the community becomes familiar with what with you and what and what's mm -hmm. going on, then um, people respond better. Mm -hmm. And and the con the, the continuous communication. So right. a lot of times we they, people come in or groups come in, they survey, they leave, and then they don't see anything from as a result of their their contribution to the survey. Mm -hmm. And so you know there was continuous communication throughout this process at every step. Mm 
to let them know. And then the report was available for anybody who wanted to see it. And, mm -hmm. and everybody, you know, who gave us emails um, got the report. And then that's where the, the celebration is really key because if you don't want to read the report, you can come and celebrate with everybody and hear mm -hmm. what's happening um, and contribute. So the, the continuous communication, which leads to your building your trust, yeah. which I heard a really great quote yesterday that trust is the engine of your program. And if you can't start your engine, you can't do your program. And I loved that quote. And so that's what you did all along was building that trust and that relationship um, with the residents and, and with the organizations that are around there just to, enough to say, you know what, just, just wait, hold off, see what happens um, and go forth. I'm just, I'm looking at the time. Um, is there one last question? We have a question. Mm-hmm. Hey, Cheryl and Lisa, this is a really great work. Uh, we have sort of a three-pronged, uh, two questions and a request. Uh, why did you decide to do this? Uh, will you consider doing it at other locations? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, Heather, if we could all reconvene in like a year from now and get another update from Cheryl and Lisa, maybe some <laughs> residents of this community to hear what the next year's progress looks like. I love it. <laughs> yeah. okay, Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. We, we would love that. We would love that, actually. Um, so why we started in the first place, I think it was, it just happened really organically where we were, you know, we, we, we just started our work and realized we hit a rut and it yeah, it wasn't <laughs> working. And, uh, and then we found Tamarack. So it was almost like destiny. And, uh, <laughs> and everything, everything that, uh, you know, we heard at that at that conference, Lisa and I just kept looking at each other like, like, you know, it, it was just like the answers were just pouring in into our souls. So we were, um, we were just really, really lucky um, and privileged to have, have uh, met Heather and, and the, you know, being mentored by Tamarack has, has just been incredible. Um, I think your next question was, what was it? There was why we got involved. And then there was, if you'll consider doing it at an location. I missed that. What was the second part? If you would consider trying this at another location. Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so me and Cheryl, like we said in the beginning, we were brand new to all of the community development stuff. Um, and when we, we started, we just sort of said, okay, what, what are we going to do? So we started kind of meeting with different municipalities, different community developers, and what they were doing. Um, while still trying to do the programs that we had um, started to get, tried to get going in the community that were failing, epic failing, Heather, thank you. Um, and then we went to Kitchener and, you know, learned about ABCD and then learned about the, the local deepening community initiative. And we thought, Heather's gonna, gonna mentor us, Heather can help us learn. So, um, so that's sort of. Yeah, so the whole idea was that we would work on this project together mm -hmm. so that we can take the concepts that we learned and apply it at the other house. Yes. Mm -hmm. The the model is a train the trainer. So you know, helping you through this this first step and the and this and the six steps and then building your skills and confidence mm -hmm. um and then be able to um take this elsewhere. But I do but I do want to highlight though, um that when you've seen one neighborhood, you've only seen one neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so thinking that you're going to cookie cut and do a corn roast at, you know, the next site, it's mm -hmm. not guaranteed that that corn roast is going to be as successful as the other one. And mm -hmm. so you really have to work with the community, being creative um, and understanding that it, this is not a cookie cutter. Um, when people ask me about the, the steps and how have others done it, I, I say to them, this is how others done it in their community. Mm -hmm. There is no guarantee what they've done is going to work in your community. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to tailor it to uh, the communities you're going in. Now we are, uh, I'm actually going next week to Whitby because they're wanting to do this in a, in a, in a high rise building. Mm -hmm. um, we've done this with York uh, community housing and they've had a lot of success in terms of the, the reduced, the neighbors getting connected and knowing each other and reducing complaints 
amongst mm -hmm. each other. They have, uh, they do have a community room. And there was a question here about what do you have, what do you do when you don't have a community room? Um, they had a community room that wasn't being used. Now it's been used a lot. Um, I will make sure that Al gets the, we, we did a, uh, a community of practice with them and that she can send the recording and the case study because this is another of uh, the the whole local deepening community six-step process done in a high-rise and in social housing um, you know if you don't have a community room this is where organizations and associations can really help you with it and you you could work with them to provide their space whether it's a church basement or you know um, uh, I don't know somebody has a really big garage or a shed or something that you can use that's in the neighborhood and in the area mm -hmm. as a community room. Mm -hmm. So that would be my kind of suggestion or idea for Ellen who asked that question. Um, I realize we're really close to time and, and there's, and someone asked about when the next ABCD conference is, Al. Ta-da! <laughs> Here it is. There you go. There it is. Um, yeah, so this is this is all um, you guys, Heather and um, Cheryl and Lisa. Like this is the celebrating uh, neighbors and measuring impact of ABCD. This uh, will be held in June in London, Ontario. Um, do you do you want to um, do a little? Of course, talk? I gotta jump. I gotta jump in in here and and I and just as like I think Lisa and Cheryl already did a massive promotion for this um, and the it will, benefits. It will, it will change your life. It's a life changer. It's a life changing. It's changing. It's changing our life. Uh, and it's Fanshawe exactly. College, yeah, Fanshawe it's College has one. been partnering with us. Oh, sorry, Lisa. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you. I was just gonna say this is gonna be our third one that we're attending, so um, it's it's fantastic, but. I'll let you speak, Heather. Sorry. Yeah. So it's Fan Fanshawe College. So we're going back to college on campus um, with a and and there is going to be master classes. So there's an A B C D master class with John McKnight, the gentleman who who created it. Um, so this is an amazing opportunity um, for you to to dive deep into this. And Cheryl and Lisa are going to be there, so you could um, take them out for drinks and um, chat more. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, great. So there's there's more information that can be found on our uh, website um, on the events page. So um, this just brings us to the closing announcements before people drop off. We'll let you know of uh, a few other opportunities um, for some webinars coming up. Um, so we have a couple of ABCD uh, webinars. One is on uh, March 12th. And um, it's going to be about uh, urban indigenous. Uh, it's going to be ABCD in an urban indigenous context. So this will be with Lori Sokoluk and um, great opportunity to talk about um, traditional values and their potential to lead to a de decolonized approach to community. Um, also, there is evaluating your ABCD efforts. So that will be on March 24th with John McKnight and Howard Lawrence. And uh, this is all going to be, uh, if you want to register, you just uh, go to the events page on the Tamarack website and you can register. Um, also, for the um, cities reducing poverty, um, we have making basic income feasible in Canada, and that will be on March 12th, so another one um, right around uh, the same time, um, and also five strategies to reduce poverty in Canada, where we're going to be featuring James Hughes and uh, Tamarack's Paul Bourne. So um, you can register for these on the events page on the Tamarack website. We'll also be following up today, after today, with um, follow-up email, um, some resources, and the recording of this uh, webinar will be made available as well. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. I especially like to thank Lisa and Cheryl for uh, sharing your journey today and for Heather for um, participating in this webinar. It was really um, super interesting and um, it was really great to, to hear about your practical, um, your practical successes that you, you've had. If anybody would like more information 
about um, what you've learned today and about membership and how membership can support deepening community and poverty reduction, please uh, get in touch with us. Feel free to reach out to myself um, with any questions you might have after today. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.